Okay, I think it's my turn. Uh, I'm Edgar Gomez. I'm part of the Digital Ethnography Research Center. I'm a Vice Chancellor Postdoctoral Research Fellow. It's a long title. And as you can see, I changed the title of my, of my talk. And I think it will just somehow match uh, what we have been discussed with Paolo and with Shanti and, and Sarah. Um, I changed it because, uh, although I will be discussing some stuff about uh, time and census, I decided to, to focus more on the technology. Uh, and one of the technologies that I was discussing in the original paper, which was uh, 360 degrees camera. Uh, especially, I decided to focus more on the, on the relation between the technology and the ethnographic fieldwork. And I apologize for my thick Mexican accent. I'm pretty sure with Salma Hayek and Gael Garcia Bernal sounds better. Um, <laughs> In her 1975 text, Visual Anthropology in a Discipline of Words, Margaret Mead hoped that in the future, 360 degrees cameras will be able to preserve materials from certain cultures, claiming that the camera or tape recorder that stays in one spot, that is not tuned, worn, refocused, or visibly loaded, does become part of the background scene, and what it records did happen. Um, what is really interesting, uh, and what I want to play with here, is her comment about cameras will become part of the background scene, uh, but still record what did happen, independently or actually despite the ethnographer's presence in the field. These tensions sit at the heart of visual studies and ethnography, and, and I'll return uh, to this at the end. We do have now a number of uh, commercially available uh, 360 degrees cameras, and I want to thank uh, Juan Sanin because he was the first one who pointed at these cameras to me. Uh, and although they are becoming more and more common, uh, probably in the future, and I'm pretty sure in the future, in the next couple of years, we will see them in, in mobile phones as well. Um, Margaret meets interested in an almost naturalistic and supposedly unbiased recording device in ethnographic fieldwork seems a little bit outdated now. Her tacit assumption that the camera will be an invisible instrument for total vision seems to uh, need a, a revision. And I try to come back uh, to this at the end of the talk. In the rest of the presentation, I will outline three ideas of how 360 degrees cameras could be useful in current digital ethnographic fieldwork. These ideas seem to go precisely in the opposite direction that, that Margaret Smith dreamed. I suggest that more than an invisible tool for total vision, 360 degrees cameras will be, will be useful tool for, it, for the ethnographer's emplacement while being in fieldwork as uh, following Heather Horst's idea. Um, I'm pretty sure most of you are familiar with 360 degrees cameras, but uh, let me just do a, a little bit of a magic trick to introduce them uh, to you. Mm -hmm. This is uh, a 1908 photo called Self-Portrait with Newsboy of the American photographer Lewis Hine. It's depicting a scene uh, where a boy uh, sells newspaper in a corner of Chicago, and he looks curious at Hine's camera while he shows the, the image. Because it is early, early in the morning, we assume it's early in the morning because of the position of the sun and because the, the boy has, uh, is uh, um, selling newspaper. Uh, because it's early in the morning, we assume um, Heinz, Heinz shadow could be observed in, in, the, in the picture. While the image gives us an interesting insight of the morning activities of the city, we see people walking, clothes, uh, horse, horse carriages, buildings, and shows the photographer shooting the image, there are many interesting things that we can't possibly see uh, inside the frame. As David McDougall reminds us, we uh, are talking about corporeal images. Um, these images are not only uh, the images of other bodies. They are also images of the body behind the camera and its relations to the world. Now, the framing, uh, it's very important, and, and I mentioned the framing because, as, as uh, Borgin used to say, through the agency of the frame, the world is actually uh, organized into a coherence which it actually lacks, in a, into a paradox of tableau, a succession of decisive moments. So, after all, decisive moments are here. And I mentioned the framing because I want to play with the idea of uh, Lewis Hine uh, photo. A couple of, actually uh, one week ago, we went to Federation Square to take some pictures with, along with Bianca and Shanti. And this uh, frame, the framing of this image reminded me of Lewis Hine uh, photo. Um, and I say, and I usually, and I, and I uh, say agency and the frame because of this reason. This is actually a 360 degrees um, uh, image. Mm. 
So as you can see, uh, with the 360 degrees cameras, while still it's a photographic and video camera, the resulting images extend and enhance traditional photographic vision in one important way. Since everything is in front of the lenses, there is no hidden space in the resulting image, and therefore there is no framing, or, or there is no framing as such. Uh, John Raffman's work uh, shows us with the st Google Street View that the, the framing is what we call post-framing, could be actually part of um, the post-photography. For the first time in photographic history, the photographer is as much in front of the lenses as is in the back. And I think this could generate new ways of thinking about power vision and, and relations that all already have been discussed in many, you know, pa Paolo has discussed this and um, Enrique's work también. Uh, about the, the navigational user who turns, uh, who turns the author of the experience, the person who actually navigates the image once it's taken. In this regard, 360 degrees cameras bridge domestic photography with virtual, virtual reality systems. It is not a coincidence that virtual reality commercial headsets um, are becoming also widely available at the same time these cameras uh, are in the market. So some people are starting to talk about this as uh, virtual reality photography. It's important to notice that um, the difference between these cameras and the long history of panoramic photography, uh, accounting for panorama, cycloramas, the panopticon, software as Photosynth, uh, Microsoft Photosynth, apps, etc. The difference is that the 360 degrees cameras produce a single file from two or more stitched images that are taken at the same time. This creates not not a panorama, but an spherical image, as you can see here. This is the same image that we were um, seeing before. Sarah Pink has expanded the realm of visual studies into sensorial understanding of the ethnographic fieldwork, where the important is not only what is depicted um, in images, but the being there in fieldwork, of having actually participating in the environment represented visually. I think 360 degrees cameras, as one of the latest digital visual technologies, could open uh, indeed, and, and I'm quoting again Sarah, a route into a more complex multi-sensoriality of, of the experiences, activities, and events we might be investigating by, by showing the ethnographer actually in, in being in field. It's funny how um, I'm using uh, the Ricoh Theta S, which is one of the cameras available in the market. And it's, it's funny how they use the, um, the metaphor of small uh, planet to talk about these kind of images. In this sense, these images could embody a different way of seeing that we are still uh, to explore and fully understand. Because uh, as also, as any digital image, we can um, post it on online media, opening interest, interesting ways to share fieldwork and placement. So I don't know if you have seen it in Facebook. I think uh, a couple of months ago, uh, Facebook actually allowed these kind of images to be uh, updated, um, uh, uploaded, sorry. So let me show you um, a couple of examples of this. Imagine that you're doing fieldwork. I'm currently not, not doing any fieldwork, uh, but I would love to do fieldwork in Sydney Road, which is one of the most fascinating streets I've, I've ever found. And you have to share your notes, your, uh, the notes about uh, the description of your, place, your emplacement in the field with, let's say, colleagues, co-researchers, supervisors, etc about some of the places you're researching. You could describe, for example, this barbershop with words, or take several images combining details with wider shots. But, it, but in this kind of, and I quote uh, Paolo here, semiotically dense environments, um, to use his expression, 360 degrees cameras could uh, be used to apprehend and share what I call the beautiful complexity of everyday messiness and our emplacement as ethnographers in it. And as you can see in the images, uh, even though you can trigger or shoot the image remotely by, with your mobile phone or your tablet or whatever, I like, I like to be in the image because it shows my emplacement in the field. So the kind of images that, that I create are always part of what I'm experiencing in, in the image. Um, some other example, I, use this, I uploaded this photo to um, Facebook um, a couple of days ago. And, and I ask people, what do you see in this image? What, what, is, what catches your attention in this image? And what is interesting is that different people actually uh, talk about different um, things that uh, caught their attention. 
But what is interesting, what I found interesting about these kind of images is that later, as, fi as visual field notes, we can actually think about, like, how did I feel when I was there? What did I saw? Um, what I'm seeing now? Um, what is the relationship between what I'm seeing and what I'm not seeing? And what is my position within, within this? Let me show you uh, another example. And this is from my, from my field work uh, about photography practices in, in Barcelona. Um, during my field work, I found a lot of these situations where, for example, this photo, it's actually the photo of a photographer taking a photo. So, you know, in my field work, I found this was very important for the group because that was a, a matter of, of a way to, to bonding. Oh, sorry, I just put all the water on top of the computer so if at some point you start to feel that That's there's... my computer. I'm so sorry. It's all right, I'll, I'll get it. Thank you. Okay, sorry. So, um, I was telling you, sorry. So these two images actually represent a single action. But I found those, these two images in the, in the uh, photo stream of Flickr of different participants. And for me, it was so difficult to actually see the whole uh, scene in one image. Because it's not only, you know, you can actually capture the, the, the action of, photograph, of someone photographing someone else. But what you can capture... Um, no, I'll do, I'll do. You talk. Okay. Yeah. But what you can't capture is like the people behind us, the people talking about the, the action, etc., which was very important. Um, a few weeks ago, I was in Barcelona again, and I took this image, and you can see Elisenda, which is a long, long-time friend of Derek and, and some of the colleagues uh, from uh, QAT. So we were having a, a, a beer and discussing some ethnographic and anthropological stuff, very serious stuff, of course, in Barcelona. And this is, this is, a, this is another way to actually see a 360 degrees camera uh, uh, image as, as a single shot that captures all the, um, all the situation in a single way. Another example of this, for example, could be how, to, how we capture, um, this is the airport in a, in a um, um, one of the lounges at the airport really late at night, or the movement and the, the complexity of different scenes where the ethnographer is positioned. We can also uh, use this kind of imagery, for example, in interviews or meetings, etc. Now, just to finish uh, this, and because otherwise it will, it will seem that I'm kind of like praising this uh, kind of photography or this kind of imagery, I want to briefly talk about the politics of 360 degrees images. Although I'm really excited about the creative uses of these images and their potential for ethnographic fieldwork, and, and obviously this, this watery presentation uh, seems to show it. The use of these cameras in other areas such as journalism, media production, will, will grow in the future. Actually, in the Venice, uh, in the Venice Film Festival, they presented the first um, virtual reality um, film. But also, I'm afraid this will be used in the future for surveillance, and combined with GoPros and combined with um, drones, it will just present some really interesting challenges uh, for power vision. And so, if we think about some of the elements that we can actually think about these cameras, some, such as the being there, the tall vision, the invisible cameras, I don't know if you noticed in the pictures, but the only thing that you can't actually see is the camera as an object. Uh, if we combine that with some other stuff about um, that previously was understood as part of the photographic um, realm, such as objectivity, indexicality, and reproduction, we will have a very challenging um, uh, situations coming ahead. So I suggest um, that instead of taking the um, Margaret Smith route to think about these images, or, or the possibilities of this uh, total vision and invisible cameras, we just hack or we switch um, how do we understand these images in, in field work. By using these technologies, uh, we could have uh, important implications, implications for refiguring uh, digital visual techniques. And, to, and we have to be pretty aware of their politics and their possible implications for ethnographic method. To think critically about these uh, images is as important 
as the, as the cameras themselves, as, as the use of the cameras themselves. So we want to bring them back, uh, not the invisibility of the cameras, but actually the, the politics and the visibility of the cameras as part of an ethnographic reflection. Um, thanks. Um, hi, Edgar. Hi, Yoko. I want to I ask a, a cheeky question, because I think you'd like it. Of course. Um, I, if I, I'm worried about a camera that takes everything, you mm. know, as you say, 360 degrees. So does it mean that more detail is good? And if so, is there any reason for us to think about things not things that are not there? Hmm. Like, the, what is the value of things that are not there? Yeah, it's it's funny because we had actually that discussion yesterday in in Paolo's workshop about like, is it necessary to record everything? Do we want to record everything? Uh, is it useful for field work? I guess I guess it's it's a it's a question that requires an answer that goes beyond ethics. You know, it, it is obviously a matter of ethics, but it's more than that. Uh, and I totally agree with you. But I also think that we can see the other way around, which is that for the first time we can actually do, uh, let's say, visual ethnographies when the when the ethnographer is actually part of that and actively part of that. And that requires also uh, to think about reflexivity in a different way because, because of that, because you, the, the whole unbalance between who has the power of uh, uh, seeing the others uh, and remaining visible, it switches. So I don't, I, don't, I don't necessarily think that we should or could use these cameras to capture everything, but to capture us doing field work, which is a different thing. Um, I, I'm not sure about how do we could use these images in the final product, let's say a document, a, 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 an interactive documentary or a web page or whatever. I think that's that's second layer of um, um, of discussion. But I absolutely agree with you. Um, my, my question slightly builds on Yoko's. Um, if we think about like the first concepts or writings about an opticon um, going back a long time, it's very much a psychological effect of changing people's behaviour because of the power of observation. So, um, and again, building on what Yoga said, how much might it be changing the ethnographic approach by seeing everything? It actually changes what we see and observe, which might introduce an artefact. Any thoughts on that? I, I think we are, I may not be clear in my presentation, but what I, what I was thinking instead of seeing, using these images as seeing something or everything, I was thinking about the use of these cameras to, to feel more than you actually do when you see things. So, you know, it, it, I'm trying to align with some of the things that Shanti was uh, presenting about the sensory uh, experience of ethnographic fieldwork. So again, I don't think, I think we should be very careful uh, not to fall into, into the you know, excitement and, and that's what I use the, the quote of Margaret Mead because she could be very excited about this. But use it in a different way, which is uh, somehow hacking this, the scene part of it to, to focus and think more about the sensing to, to focus more about the feeling part of it. Because once you see yourself at, in, in this sphere, when you feel yourself, you can just like retrace, to, again to use uh, some of the words that we, were, we have been discussing, you can retrace how you felt. And, and I think that could be a really interesting um, tool for reflexivity in fieldwork. Yeah, I too am sort of concerned about um, 
the implications of capturing everything. Because I, and this website I think came in um, Shanties, and I'd kind of like both of you to um, maybe talk about, you know, there's still a point of view from where the camera is placed, um, and there's still a particular field of vision. And I'm just thinking, you know, there's you know, things that are central to your field of vision, things that are right on the periphery, on the edge of your vision, as it were. Um, how do you sort of start to think about these with your ethnographic work when you can capture 360 or from a particular position on your body with a GoPro? Yeah, I think, I think that's the key, but uh, what I'm, re I mean, it's really exciting uh, to talk about these technologies because even though we are critical um, thinkers and academics, etc., we still fall into the trap of the excitement of these kind of images. I, and you, you say something like the capture everything, and Yoko mentioned it, and Adrian mentioned it, and, and I don't think, so that's the first layer, you know, we can capture everything. But then the second layer is what you just mentioned, like the fact that the body of the researcher is actually has agency because you have to trigger, you have to actually click the camera. So your, your arm will be visible, your body will be visible, your, your presence uh, will be visible. And I think, at least for me, that's the most interesting feature of these cameras, not the fact that you can uh, use them uh, to capture everything. But then on the other hand, which I think is also very interesting, is that you, you can share that image for example, with your informants. And they can tell you what they see in that image and what, what they feel in, in, you know, by seeing this image. Kind of like a photo elicitation. And if you, if you are familiar with the work of uh, John uh, Raffman, which he did a wonderful work with uh, Google Street View, he pretty much tried to bring back the frame into the chaos of this um, continuous image, which is uh, Google Street View. And I, think, and I think that's the key. Instead of thinking just about framing or about the, uh, the absence of framing because we see everything, we can use these images as part of our relationship with, with informants, as part of our relationship in, uh, with, with people in the field. Because that, these images could allow to different people to see different things, to feel different things, and to, to share those things with the, with the ethnographer. I don't know. If, if I kind of answer your question, but I... What if I could respond to that quickly, Moshe? I, I very much don't think about capture. I mean, this in mm. fact, it's a word I, don't, I really, really try to resist using when I write about it, because it, it sort of assumes that there is something to be captured, and, and that's not how I'm kind of conceiving of the video trace at all, or indeed my own use of GoPros. I see it more as, 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 as something that is an artifact of the experience that is one way into the experience, but not by any means the only way, and not something that freezes or captures time, but something that continues to emerge and to live as you discuss and reflect and work with it in an ongoing way. So absolutely, there are things that are, you know, that the eye doesn't, the eye of the camera or the ear of the camera doesn't doesn't record, but but I'm not. You know, you, know, you know, I don't see it as, as you know, like the, there's, there's some environment that I'm trying to capture. Yeah, but we'll also, um, you know, record or, you know, there will be traces of things that you may not have been aware of sure. as you were walking. Yeah, just, well. just, as, just as any of us as we make our way through our surroundings, yeah, in our experience of yeah. the world, don't ex you know, of course there's always things. And, th and this question of noticing and not noticing. You know, was something that I was starting to think about as well. And where does that, where does noticing erupt and 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 emerge, and when does it sort of subside? But 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 I personally, I resist. I you know, I don't like the word capture because it assumes a kind of a you know, a kind of false objectivity for for me. That's yeah. anyway. Wait, was there one question up here? Yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, my question is to do with there's a lot of uh, discussion about ethnography and. Um, when you mentioned, Edgar, the possibility of uh, combining um, with drones and GoPro and whatever, I was actually wondering about um, actually the possibility or how you perceive um, maybe the generation of more theoretical inquiry in terms of how um, these tools could be involved. And in that respect, I suppose 
also how it brings co-creation into the generation of theory instead of mm. kind of ethnographic. Uh, yeah, I think that's what we're trying to do, uh, at least to start a conversation today. Uh, and Sarah, in the morning, presented some of the some of the big issues that pretty much tackle all these technologies. Like, um, do we need new theories to understand this? Do we need new theoretical tools, methodological tools? Do we have to um, uh, develop theories and methodologies for the for the technologies, or should we just include technologies in our own? Uh, methodological and, and theoretical work. So it's, it's an ongoing question. I don't think there's a, I, I definitely don't have an answer to that. But I, but I think this is the, the right place and the right moment to be asking those questions. All right, I'm afraid that's what we've got to have. We're going to take a 10 minute break while we reorganize our four flooded facilities. Uh, so I'm going to stretch and I'm not sure what time it is now, but come back in 10 minutes from whatever time it is now.